thanks, uh, Jonas and everyone from PacBio for inviting me here. Um, and thanks also to Jenny for organizing um, and helping me out with everything you're, I don't know if she's even in here, but she's really good at her job and I'm really appreciative of that. Um, so I am a parasitologist. I have a really particular need for ISOSeq and it um, suited that need really well. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you about some interesting experiments we did and how ISOSeq, how we leveraged ISOSeq to help um, so I hope the talk's interesting to you and perhaps valuable as well. So we study a uh, worm called filarial nematode. Filarials uh, means thread-like, so they're really small and skinny, and they have this complicated life cycle, uh, which this, yeah, is it working up there? Not really that well. Okay, so um, they live in humans, um, at least the ones that we study. They're dioecious, so they're male and female. Uh, females give rise to uh, MF or microfilari, uh, that which circulate in the bloodstream. Microfilari then picked up by uh, blood feeding mosquitoes. And then within the mosquito host, they have this very particular um, and patterned migration that is temporally patterned and spatially patterned. Um, depending, and during that time, there's a number of different molts and the worms grow, they become intracellular. Uh, and then eventually they end up at the head parts, uh, the mouth region of the mosquito to be dropped onto the skin during uh, blood feeding and then travel through the bite wound. They molt again to L4s. And this is not as, not great. Anyway, they molt again to L4s and uh, travel to the lymphatics of the human where males and females live. Filarial nematodes as nematodes are related to C. elegans and so they have some similarities particularly in life cycle, there are a number of molts. Um, C. elegans are hermaphrodites, filaria worms have male, are male and female. Um, but one of, so we can use C. elegans to learn about filarial parasites. Um, but one of the nice thing about C. elegans is that the life cycle only goes three and a half days, whereas in filarial parasites, they obviously go through a mosquito. They are always, as obligate parasites, they're always in a host. Uh, it takes two weeks in the mosquito and then several months to become patent in the human and then they can live for years in the human host. And so that um, gives us some experimental difficulties, so we use C. elegans where appropriate. Filarial parasites cause disease that are important to both human and animal health. So this is a graph that on the y-axis has uh, the years lived with disability due to disease annually of a number of different infectious diseases. Helminths are parasitic worms, and the disease that we study is lymphatic filariasis. Um, and you'll notice that because of these chronic diseases, helminth diseases cause debilitating disease that are similar to other many more famous diseases like malaria, um, more than hepatitis or Ebola or other STIs. Um, and yet many people don't know about them because they infect the um, most poor people in the world in the developing world. And because of this reason, uh, they've been termed neglected tropical diseases um, by the World Health Organization and prioritized for research. Um, and so that's why we study them. The disease we study is called lymphatic filariasis. It infects over 120 million people in the developing world and advanced manif manifestations cause something called elephantiasis. So you can see in both of these patients, um, what happens is the worms, the adult worms live in the lymphatics and they cause tissue degeneration of the lymphatics and blockage. And normally lymphatics are supposed to drain lymph back into circulation, but when the lymphatics aren't working, we get this lymphedema in different um, peripheral tissues like the legs or the scrotum. And this is a non-reversible, and so it causes a lot of severe defects. Um, the, the species that we study is called Brugia malayi um, because there is an animal model for Brugia malayi, and there are a few other dis, uh, species that are out there in the wild as well. Relatedly, um, we have Dirofilaria imminis, which is more popularly known as heartworm. Uh, heartworm then infects dogs. Anyone who has a dog should be treating their dog every month with heart guard or something like it to make sure that they don't get heartworm. Um, these parasites are very closely re related, all transmitted by mosquitoes. Um, heartworm obviously live in the heart, not the lymphatics. Um, the problem with these, there are many problems obviously with these diseases. One of these is resistance. So for heartworm, there's resistance in the Mississippi River Delta and also tropical regions, and this, is, this resistance is spreading. So in tropical regions, endemic countries, there's mass drug administration where millions of children every year are dewormed. But 
um, with that much drug pressure, eventually resistance evolves and will spread, and that is, so there's a great need for new antihelmintics. And so our goal is to characterize novel therapeutic targets, particularly receptors, and learn more about worm biology. Um, we use a number of different tools, molecular biology, pharmacology, and target-based screening. The image on the top right is the incidence of heartworm in 2016, so you can see it's really high in the American South, and that's also where resistance is and where it's spreading, and I was even talking to people who said um, they know about resistance, I think, in the Northeast as well. Um, the image on the bottom right is um, the habitat of Aedes aegypti, which is a mosquito vector for lymphatic filariasis, and because of climate change and the warming of the globe, of some areas of the globe, the habitats of Aedes aegypti will spread, and the disease will spread too because of that. So the orange and red regions are where Aedes isn't now and where it will be by 2050. And so we really need new drugs to be able to treat these diseases. A big problem is that we want to do molecular biology against targets, um, but the genomes are pretty fragmented and poorly annotated. So on the left is Brugge Malaya. We do have a chromosome level genome, um, and so that's helpful, but many of the genes are not well annotated and the models aren't correct. Di heartworm on the right um, is a huge mess, and uh, N50 is really small. There's thousands, hundreds of thousands of contigs. Um, and for Brugge Malaya, um, we have some isoforms identified, uh, but heartworm, we don't have any isoforms. It's only one predicted transcript per gene. And that, that leads um, to really difficult and cum cumbersome cloning. So if we have a drug target of interest, we want to clone it, we want to ex uh, heterologously express it in some screening platform, uh, it's really difficult if your gene model isn't good, isn't correct. And so our goal was really simple. We wanted to use IsoSeq to improve gene models. Um, the primary goal was to achieve high coverage of the transcriptome with full-length isoforms validated for each gene, uh, with particular interest given to the drug targets that we study. And we had a number of secondary goals. One was just to improve public resources, like worm-based parasite. Uh, two was to perform comparative transcriptomics between Brugia and heartworm, and then between males and females. And then also get a global view of transplicing. So nematodes are one of few organisms that have uh, transplicing, and that's really interesting. And one of few animals that have operons or polycystronic mRNAs. And so um, I, we thought ISOC could help with that as well. This genome browser at the top will demonstrate um, one of the problems that we have. So this is a receptor target that we're interested in, and it's probably one gene, but in the genome, it's identified as two separate genes. So here it is on the five prime end, and that's a, predicted as a single gene um, on the top. Uh, lane, and on the other side is a single gene, and so it's predicted as two genes. Uh, on the bottom lane is an isoseq read that I just blasted to the genome, and so it connected those two models, um, just demonstrates how isoseq can really help us with gene prediction. Uh, so these are images of what the worms look like. Brugia is really small, a couple centimeters by 100 microns, um, so it's really hard to get RNA from them. Nematodes are very transcript poor. Um, they're described as a tube in a tube, so they have this really thick collagen cuticle, and then inside is an intestine and a bunch of what's called pseudocelemic fluid. Not very much mRNA in there. Dirofilaria imminis is much larger, so we were able to just use one adult male and female. And all the sequencing done was done at UW-Madison Biotech Center. Uh, so we had four libraries, each on a single smart cell. Uh, I won't belabor these points. Um, this might be really exciting to some of you, and it doesn't mean as much to me, but I think it went really well. I was told it went really well, and I, so I was really happy. Um, and then uh, we, did, we had ISOSEQ 3.1 at this point to be able to um, identify isoforms, and then we con I concatenated those reads um, by species and then used different splice-aware uh, alignment tools to map to the reference. Um, and then did QC and analysis with uh, Squanty, which I lean really heavily on, bed tools are, and other sort of sources. So I'll talk about just some of the general um, QC of the data set that we have, and then how I used it to look at particular receptors. So um, in all, and from now on, I'm just gonna be talking about Brugia malaei, um, not heartworm. So in all, we had over 60,000 total reference corrected reads. Um, so these are redundant, once they were collapsed, we had about 25,000, um, they were collapsed by exon structure, 
and then uh, which covered about 53% of the transcriptome. Um, and 40% of those were shared between sexes. So we didn't get maybe as much coverage as we would have liked, um, but we did get some good discrepancy between males and females. Um, one of the things that we learned and we knew going uh, in ahead of time is ISOSeq is, you, the data that you get out is as good as the mRNA you put in. And um, with these worms, it's really hard to get full length mRNA. It's really, it was, we had to sacrifice a number of gerbils to be able to get enough worm tissue to do it. And so um, it was, that was a real pain. Um, and some of the data that you'll see is a result of just poor RNA quality. Um, and there's not much we can do about that, but we did learn some things. Um, many people have gone through uh, these categorizations. These are really nice um, for full splice match, incomplete splice match, novel in catalog, and novel not in catalog. And again, I'll refer you to an honest paper on that. And so if you remember from some of the other talks, like the grizzly bear talk yesterday, many of um, his isoforms were full splice matches, and ours, in contrast, were not that way. In fact, most of the isoforms were novel, not in catalog. So immediately that shows you that this is really worthwhile because we're identifying new splice junctions that weren't originally annotated in the transcriptome in the genome. 22% um, contain incomplete splice matches, and um, Probably most of that is fragmented mRNA, um, and I'll show you a little bit of data why I think that. And then 20% had validated uh, annotated splice junctions. Where I'm also looking at these fusion genes, or categorized as fusion, because those could be polycystronic. So a big question that I've had is, are the incomplete splice matches new isoforms, or are they just degraded um, mRNA? And so one thing I looked at is, of the um, full splice matches and incomplete splice matches, which included five prime UTR or extended the annotated five prime UTR, and then also the same on the three prime UTR. And you can see that, oh boy. Um, for in the pink, which are full splice matches, most of them included and extended five prime UTR. And for the incomplete splice matches, it's hard to do this without a pointer, I'm sorry. Um, most of them included three prime UTR, but not five prime UTR. And so that's just a really good suggestion that we're getting five prime degradation. Um, and so those probably aren't true isoforms. Another bit of evidence is that of the incomplete splice matches, the reference length is significantly longer. And so there are longer transcripts that are degrading more. Um, one thing that I've thought about for nematodes in particular is, you know, there are different library prep and cDNA synthesis approaches to be able to make sure you get full length transcripts. One thing for nematodes is that we have transplicing. So um, most metazoa undergo cis splicing where introns are spliced out. Um, nematodes have transplicing where the five prime UTR is fused to a splice leader sequence of the pre mRNA. And that in C. elegans, there are multiple splice leader sequences SL1, SL2, although most of them are SL1. In Brugia, it's only SL1, and it's an invariant um, 22 nucleotide splice leader, which um, could, help you help, could help me identify which of those reads were full length. Unfortunately, only 45 reads had that five prime splice leader. Um, if I were to do it again, I would probably incorporate that uh, splice leader into the CD, cDNA synthesis step, um, but they're that could introduce some bias as well, because we don't know how many transcripts have that splice leader. Um, then we look at other categories and ask if they're artifactual. One thing we can look at is where along the length of the transcript junctions occur, splice junctions occur. For sp full splice matches, um, it's sort of this even distribution across the entire transcript with tails on the five prime and three prime ends. And we can look at some of these other categories, and it's not that way. Some of this is due to sample size. There aren't just as not as many transcripts in these categories, um, but there's this bias towards the three prime end, which suggests that those are probably artifactual. And the other categories, um, like novel, not in catalog, pretty even distribution with a strange sort of peak at the three prime end, novel in catalog and fusion have a distribution like the full splice match, which suggests that those are true isoforms. Whereas incomplete splice match, there's not the, the tail at the five prime end, again, suggesting that these are degraded products. Okay, um, that's what the data looked like. Now, what about the biological question that we're interested in? So um, 
I study chemosensation of parasites, and there are really three particular parts of chemosensation. So one, I mentioned that intramosquito migration. So this is patterned. It happens on very specific days after infection. After infection. And if, it, if the worms aren't able to get to the head, then they aren't able to transmit. So this is a really important biological process, and chemosensation is probably involved. Again, is transmission from the mosquito to the mammal. Um, they have to go through a bite wound. Uh, mosquitoes are often thought of as syringes, just pushing diseases into um, things that they're taking a blood meal on. That's not the case with filarial parasites. It's actually pretty cool. They drop into a puddle of saliva and then swim through the saliva into the bite wound. So that, there's some sensory modalities involved there. And then males and females have to find each other in the lymphatics. And so our idea is that these biological processes are something that could be um, inhibited in some way by some sort of antihelmintic, um, which would stop transmission. In nematodes, we know what the, uh, chemosen the chemosensation pathway looks like. So chemosensory cues activate GPCRs on the nose, basically, of a nematode, which then, depending on cell type, will activate uh, uh, ion channels such as OSM9, which is a trip channel, or CNG channels. And so OSM9 was a target we're interested in. We wanted to clone it, we wanted to express it, and see if we could pharmacologically characterize it. Unfortunately, in the Bruegge Malay I model, um, there's a mispredicted three prime end. So maybe you can appreciate um, the C. elegans OSM9, which is completely characterized, is on the bottom here. And then two other filarial nematode homologs are in the middle. And then on the top is the Bruegge Malay OSM9. So hopefully the colors will show you that there's really good alignment, especially like right here, um, and then Bruegge Malay, it's completely off. So that's a really good suggestion that that gene model is incorrect, um, and so we can't just synthesize that gene and express it, and even designing primers to clone it will be difficult. So isoform sequencing actually worked really well here. Um, unfortunately, you can see what I'm talking about when I talk about five prime degradation. So this is the gene model, the reference model on the bottom, and then all of these are different isoseq reads. There's this really strong three prime bias. We were able to get one read that covered the entire model, which was encouraging and helpful to extend the five prime UTR. But then there's this red mark right here in all of the reads that indicated that there was a mispredicted splice acceptor site. And I'll show you um, what that looks like. So in the reference, it's the splice acceptor is predicted as this canonical AG. So, um, Splice, they're really canonical splice uh, recognition sequence, GT, AG, on the three prime end. But all of the isoseq reads actually suggested that the acceptor site was a GG, um, which is really interesting because GGs don't show up very often as splice acceptor sites. Um, and we ended up cloning it and that we confirmed that. And the result of that is that the reference had this um, 41 nucleotide deletion that then resulted a frame shift when it was predicting the coding sequence and that's why the th three prime end was messed up. So we were able to clone OSM9, um, and all of this is in a, a preprint and is in revisions right now. Um, and there's a lot of other stuff in that paper that I think is really cool. Um, but then we expressed it in a C. elegans knockout. So this is a different nematode. Um, there are really good assays for chemotaxis in C. elegans. Um, OSM9 knockouts are unable to chemotax to diacetyl. Um, and then we expressed the Brugia OSM9 in the knockout to see if it would rescue. It didn't rescue, but we know it's not because the gene model was incorrect. So there's some other biological thing going on there, um, which actually opens up really interesting avenues um, studying the chemosensation pathway of nematodes. What about other targets? So another GPCR we're interested in is GAR3. In C. elegans, it's involved in food consumption and pharyngeal pumping, and we think it might be important to consumption in the parasites. Uh, we were able to get two um, isoseq reads. One of them was full length, and this, in this case, we were able to just synthesize it. We didn't need to clone it because we were so confident in the, uh, the sequence. And then again, we used C. elegans as a heterologous expression plat. Oh, so there's a GIF going right now that must be messing up the entire, that's a bummer. Um, so the GIF's not gonna go, but what we did is we expressed it in a single cell in the C. elegans amphid sensory neurons along with a genetically encoded calcium dye, and then we can trap the worm and run different chemicals along the head of the worm 
And if it activates that receptor, it results in influx of calcium and fluorescence of that neuron. And so you can see there's a strong influx in calcium as soon as acetylcholine is put onto the nose of the worm. And you would have seen a really cool flashing of that neuron, um, but unfortunately didn't work. So we were able to deorphanize the receptor and show that um, it does respond to acetylcholine. And so that's just a bit about how Isoseq, we're able to use it to um, study more and new drug targets and pharmacologically characterize them. We have a number of different ne next steps, um, some of that I already mentioned. So I've looked briefly for polycystronic mRNAs. Um, I can't find any, at least those that people have said are polycystronic, um, but maybe some are there. Uh, and then I also want to look at um, global analysis of transplicing to see if it's just SL1. Um, one of the problems is that, uh, as I said, the worm is described as a tube in a tube, and all of our targets are expressed at the head, because at basically everything interesting that happens in the worm happens in the first millimeter of the worm. So the pharynx is up there, the nerve ring is up there, um, the vulva and um, the amphid sensory neurons. But unfortunately, the worm is this really long thing um, that has an intestine and body wall muscle and other sorts of things that we're not interested in. And um, most of the transcripts that we got in ISOSEQ uh, were not from the head, they were from the rest of the body. And so what we'd like to do is be able to um, enrich for the areas or tissues that we're interested in, um, and maybe the new low input protocol will help that. This is actually a light sheet image explaining what I just said. So you can see all of the nuclei down here from the body wall muscle and intestine. And once you get to the interesting part, it's really nuclei poor and transcript poor. Um, and we've actually been doing slicing across the entire worm and then RNA-seq with short reads. And so that is demonstrated here where you can see this very transcript poor at the head of the worm and then it increases as we get down to the rest of the body. So hopefully new uh, approaches will help us get at the targets we're interested in. Uh, this is the lab. As I mentioned, um, all of the sequencing done, was done at UW Biotech Center, which is a PAC Bio CSP, so um, they helped us a ton, and I would encourage you to learn from them and use them, um, and then a number of different collaborators. So thank you very much. <laughs>